So what I'll be talking about is joint work mostly with Anne Pichon, but partly also Lev Beerbrier. And so what I want to talk about is applying three manifolds to the local structure of complex algebraic sets. So let me start off with a very basic theorem, which goes back at least to Whitney, probably earlier, which is the so-called conical structure theorem. So you assume you have a complex analytic set V and a point in it, which I'll call zero. And we just look at the germ of this. In other words, we just look at a neighborhood of the point zero. And then the conical structure theorem says that if you take a neighborhood small enough, so take some epsilon zero greater than zero, then for any smaller epsilon, one has that if you intersect V with the ball of radius epsilon. So I'm going to think of this V always sitting inside a sub CN zero. So we embed it in sub CN so we can talk about intersecting with a ball. We intersect V with the ball of radius epsilon. And this is homeomorphic simply to the cone on V intersection with the boundary of this ball. So the picture is that you have some sort of a singularity. You intersect with a ball. And this region here, what you have is the cone over this region here. This intersection here is called the link of the singularity. We'll call it L. L is V intersection, the boundary of the ball. And this is the link of the singularity. So in particular, I'm interested, especially in dimension 2, V of dimension 2. Then when we intersect this two complex two-dimensional thing with a sphere, we're getting something three-dimensional, real three-dimensional. And so our L, so if V is two-dimensional, then L is a three-manifold or, well, I'm going to assume three-manifold. In general, there might be singularities going away from this singular point, but we'll restrict to normal singularities. And for normal, singular, for normal surfaces, the singularities are always isolated. So we're looking at an intersection. And we're getting a complete topological de description, therefore, of the local structure of V in terms of the link of the singularity. And the possible three manifolds, L, that occur here are very well understood. goes back to resolution of singularities by Zariski, Hirzebruch, Jung, and so on, giving. And from the resolution, one then gets a plumbing description. And the plumbing description the statement is that the link of a, sil a, link of a singularity, the three manifolds that arise are exactly the neighborhoods of negative definite plumbing. So that's one way of describing what three manifolds can occur. There are nicer ways. And if there's time, I might say in more detail. But anyway, these manifolds, things that are obtained by plumbing, they're what are called Waldhausen manifolds or graph manifolds. And another way of describing the sort of manifolds that occur here, this L is has 
a JSJ decomposition with no hyperbolic pieces. So basically, it's glued together out of ciphered fibered manifolds. And not everything glued together out of ciphered fibered manifolds is the link of a singularity. But there are kind of positivity assumptions if you take a lot of ciphered manifolds and glue them together, assuming things are rather negative, negative assumptions. If you assume sufficiently many things are negative, then you actually get a link of a singularity. So on the one hand, therefore, we have a very nice topological classification. We understand very fully here. So we have that um, complex surface singularities You have the topology is fully understood. Let me call it the zero. Well, on the other hand, the analytic structure is basically not understood. So the analytic structure on the other side There are families of very simple singularities, the so-called family of simple singularities, for instance, then rational singularities, um, minimally elliptic singularities. There are some singularities where the analytic structure is reasonably well understood. But when one gets away to more complicated examples, one really doesn't understand the analytic structure. So we have this very radical dichotomy between fully understood topology and not understood analytic structure. And it was something that Zariski worked on for a quarter of a century, trying to find something that mediates between these two extremes. So Zariski, in work ending in the late 70s, in fact, came up with a concept of equi Zariski equisingularity, as it's nowadays called. He called it algebra geometric um, equisingularity, which is a bit of a mouthful, so Zariski equisingularity is easier. And Zariski equisingularity is, gives an equivalence relation on singularities in terms of a family. You take a, instead of just looking at a single singularity, you have it varying according to a parameter, t itself in some parameter space. Again, always looking at germs, always looking at small neighborhoods. And Zariski equisingularity, which I won't describe now, I'll describe it later, was his approach at getting a tamer, a tamer classification than the not understood analytic structure, but which goes beyond topology. So the idea was that if you're in a equisingular family, then in some sense all of these singularities are of the same type. And you're getting a classification which is a much tamer classification compared to analytic structure. So I'll come back to Zariski equisingularity later, but let me take a totally different direction, which is to talk about Lipschitz geometry. By, of. So the Lipschitz category 
This is the category of metric spaces xd. So the objects of metric spaces, the morphisms, are maps from one metric space to another, another metric space, preserving, not preserving the geometry, but with the condition that there exists a constant such that the distance between the images of two points is bounded by this constant. So this is the definition of a Lipschitz map. And it's easy to see that the isomorphism in this category, you want to map that bijective and the inverse should satisfy this condition too. And so it's a map from xd to yd, which is first of all by, by bijective. And secondly, what has that for? No, there exist two constants now, c1 and c2, such that for all x not equal to y, if you look at the distance between f of x, you leave space, the distance between f of x and f of y, divided by the distance between x and y, that this ratio is bounded above and below. So it's less than or equal to c2, greater than or equal to c1. So distance is deformed by a bounded amount, in other words, in the so this is the isomorphism condition. And one says that these two metric spaces are by Lipschitz equivalent. And if we now look at a if we look at a general germ in any dimension of a complex variety sitting inside of some CN0. There are two different natural metrics here. You can take a metric which would cause the outer metric between, you take the distance between two points of XY measured simply inside of CN. So so this is called the outer metric. There's another metric, the inner metric, between two points, which is arc length in x from x to y. And if you know the outer metric, then, then you know the inner metric. The outer metric is a stronger metric than the inner metric. Both of these are canonical in the sense of being unique in the Lipschitz category. So if you change the CN that you're embedding in, if you change coordinates or whatever, you only change these metrics up to by Lipschitz equivalents. So these metrics are, can be thought of can, as canonical. So I'll be talking mostly about the outer metric, but, but my interest in this actually started with the inner metric. Let me just make a point about these two metrics, why they're nice to work with. Um, it was a conjecture in around, I think it was 1977, of Zevenman and Sullivan, that if you have 
some sort of an algebraic set like this or they, they looked also at real algebraic and real semi-algebraic. And if you look at things up to by Lipschitz equivalence, their conjecture was that by Lipschitz classification of algebraic sets is tame. Where if we just look at the complex case, if we look at the germ of a complex variety, one way of saying what tame means is that if you bound the embedding dimension, bound the degree of the polynomials that are used to define it, then there are only finitely many objects. So that's the sense in which one has tameness. So this was conjectured by Siebenman and Sullivan. It was proved. The first proof of this was um, Mostovsky in 19... 85? Yes, 1985, Moskovsky, Moskovsky proved the complex case, the complex analytic case. And this was very soon after Parashinsky proved the real semi-algebraic case. So that was 1988. And then quite a bit later, 2007, um, Guillaume Vallette generalized basically as far as one could go, generalized this to so-called O-minimal structures. But anyway, what one has is that by Lipschitz geometry gives you in great generality structures, gives you in great generality a nice tame classification of objects that one might be interested in. So despite the fact, despite the fact that there had been a lot of work on this in the real categories, for some reason no one really looked hard at the complex category. And in fact the first interesting example was an example of Biabra and Fernandez from, I think they first had it in around 2005, but it was published in 2008. So Biabra and Fernandez gave the first example of a germ V with the property that it wasn't, as I've just said, it's, you always have topological conical structure, but without, so where the metric structure is not conical. Their particular example was a surface where when you when towards the origin you had a neck here that shrank rapidly towards the origin while the rest shrank linearly. So this was the, the first example. It was in 2008. Um, Beerbrier was explained this while I was there to Lei Dong Trang at a con conference in Italy. And Arnold was there, and Arnold said, uh, no, this is impossible. I, these are always conical. But they're not always conical. And in fact, it turns out that they're very rarely conical. Uh, we realized very soon after that that conical structure is very rare. You always have this sort of behavior or similar behavior of regions of your link shrinking much faster than other regions of the link. And in fact, one way of if one just looks at some simple examples, one thing is that 
if you do have conical structure, then the link of the singularity is actually ciphered fiber. In other words, it consists of only one ciphered fiber manifold rather than lots glued together. So conical structure. So the, by the way, I should say that here I'm talking about the inner geometry, the kind of weaker geometry. But the inner conical structure implies that the link this three manifold link is a ciphered fiber manifold. But the converse is very far from true. If one simply looks at Briescon singularities given by equations of this form, x to the p plus y to the q plus c to the r, let's say with p less than or equal to q less than or equal to r, if q is not equal to r, you never have conical structure. Well, if Q is equal to R, you do have conical structure. But basically, even in these simple examples, being conical is very rare. So I'd like to say very briefly, without detail, and something about the the inner geometry, I'm mostly interested in the outer geometry, but the inner geometry of two-dimensional singularity links. So in 2008 was the first example. In 2010, Beer Brown. Uh, and Pichon and I started on a project trying to give a classification of the inner geometry. In 2012, we had it. It's published in, um, what's the name of the journal? I'm, my mind is beginning to forget names at this point, which is annoying. But, uh, So conical, when you have a metric, what I mean is simply that everything is shrinking linearly towards the origin. Up to by Lipschitz geometry. So up to by Lipschitz geometry, so you can change up to by Lipschitz geometry so that you have a strict cone. That's right, exactly, yeah. So 2014, in a paper in ACTA, we gave a complete classification, classification of the possible geometries, so of the geometry and let me very briefly just describe what the ingredients are in this. First of all, we're going to look at the link of the singularity. Remember that's V intersected with a small sphere. It's a three manifold. It's a union of ciphered fiber pieces glued together. So in other words, it's a JSJ decomposition. And what we actually have, so we write this as a union of pieces each of which is ciphered fibered. Now, something you say. But it's actually a refined version of the ciphered, of the JSJ decomposition. The point is, when you have this V, you have extra structure. If you intersect with a hyperplane, for instance, you get curves inside of V. I'll talk about if you project to C2, you get the singular set, which is also curves inside of V. And so we look at L together with these curves so, and look at the JSJ decomposition that matches curves. So this ends up being a refined version of the JSJ decomposition, just the same way as if you take the three sphere, for instance, and inside the three sphere, you draw the trefoil. Okay, the sphere together with the trefoil 
has a very different ciphered fibered structure, in this case a single fi ciphered fibered structure from the one one usually thinks of in the S in S3, which is, um, let's say, the Hopf vibration, for instance. So uh, putting in extra curves gives you different ciphered fibered structures and can divide up the ciphered fibered structures that you're looking at. So we have a decomposition into pieces. Each of these pieces has an associated rational number. So qi associated to li, where qi is an integer greater than or equal to 1. Adjacent pieces always have different qi's. As I said, these are all ciphered fibered pieces. There's always at least one piece with qi equal to 1. So qi equal to 1 occurs. And when qi is not equal to 1, then we have one of these ciphered fibered pieces. It's fi fibered by circles. But we also look at this piece as being fibered over the circle. If qi is not equal to 1, then li is fibered over the circle. And in fact, one can give a reasonably, let me draw a geometric picture of what this is going to look like. This is fibered over the circle, so the fibers are two-dimensional surfaces with boundary, of course, because they're getting glued together in pieces. So we have some sort of a surface as a fiber. And then this is fibered over the circle. And I should draw this a bit smaller so that I have room. The circle is actually a circle going around. It's the, well, let me say it this way. We're getting. Let me start off by just saying we've got a vibration over the circle. So every section here is a is one of these surfaces. And as you go around, you're actually you're at distance, you're at some distance epsilon from the origin. And as you move towards the origin, the size of the fibered pieces, let me call this fi, the diameter of fi is of order distance from the origin raised to this qi power. So qi, remember, was greater than 1. So that's saying that this is shrinking towards the origin. As we go towards the origin, the size of the fibers here is shrinking faster than linearly towards the origin. We're getting a piece like this, which lies in a neighborhood simply of a complex line, in other words, something completely flat going through V. So this whole shrinking thing sits in a neighborhood of a complex line. And then you have pieces like this glued together in the Li's. and. The special case of qi equal to 1 is you don't have a vibration like this, but the rest of the structure, everything here is very thin. It's shrinking down towards the origin fast. But then, because there are pieces with qi equal to 1, the, the pieces with qi equal to 1 are strictly conical pieces. And the classification is in terms of this decomposition into pieces most of which are shrinking fast towards the origin, but there's always some fat regions as well. Now, I'm cheating a little bit because if you glue two thin things together, they're not going to 
match very well. You'll have a space in between. So there are actually, you have to put kind of annular pieces in between the pieces to fill in the gaps. But those annular pieces are fairly trivial pieces, just filling in the gaps between the places where real topology is happening. So this is the geometric classification. You have these invariants, which are the rational numbers and the vibrations. Each vibration as a map of a three manifold to the circle is determined by a cohomology class. So we have discrete invariants throughout. And so this is giving a classification in terms of discrete invariants of the inner geometries of manifolds. And so Anne Pichon and I thought that doing the outer classification would be easy, and we always put it off because we were doing other things. In fact, we're now completing a paper to do the same for the outer geometry. The difference for the outer geometry is that instead of a single QI for each piece, we have a tree of QIs. We have a, some sort of a tree with our QI at the bottom and then larger numbers at certain points along the tree. And that these are the extra pieces of data that would need in order to have an outer classification, a classification using outer metric for the geometry. But we're still finishing writing that up. So anyway, this is classification for the um, for the by Lipschitz geometry, and now I'd like to come to simply state our main theorem and then explain more about it. So this is a theorem of Pichon and myself, which is So the theorem is, suppose that we have an analytic family. So we have a family of surface singularities Vt with T sitting inside of some parameter space. We can always take it to be some Cn. Okay. And then the theorem is that this family Vt is the risky equisingular singular, and they still have to explain what this means. If and only if Vt0 is by Lipschitz homeomorphic to V0 T for all T the n comma zero. In other words, for all t close enough to the origin. So by Lipschitz equivalence implies the risky equisingularity of the family. And when you have a the risky equisingular family, then the various things all have the same by Lipschitz structure. So this is a theorem. We actually posted it on the archive in 2012, but with a, quite a lot of extra analytic assumptions. We did just ask for a by Lipschitz isomorphism, but a semi-algebraic by Lipschitz isomorphism. And so in two, we then looked, took a different approach. 2014, we proved this without the analytic assumptions. And since then, we found a little gap, which we filled in 2016. <laughs> so it's been four years in the making. And the referees didn't yet find that gap. So this is our main theorem, that Zariski equisingularity, Zariski's approach to trying to have a tame classification turns out to be equivalent 
to, in some sense, equivalent table, we're actually saying something much stronger here than equisingularity, but it's in some sense equivalent to having um, to having as a risky equisingularity. So I should finally tell you what Zariski equisingularity is. So Zariski's, so as I said, Zariski worked on this for a quarter century, and it was in 19, uh, 1988, I think roughly, that he finally came on the version that he, he liked the best. But in the case of, so he was always polishing it, in the case of just two-dimensional singularities, his earlier versions were equivalent to this version. And what you have in general, the, so the general Zariski equisingularity, I'm going to look at any dimension, bk0. Okay. So this sits inside. At the first step, we can always take it in some Cn0. And now then we take a generic linear projection of one Cn to Ck0. OK. So this gives a generic map of v to ck. It will be some sort of a branched covering map. It will be singular along some sets. So inside up here we have the singular locus for this mapping. The singular locus is usually denoted by pi and it's usually called the polar in this context. So we have the polar, which is the singular locus for this projection. And then we take its image under, let me call this map L, we take its image under L inside of here. The image is, so L of pi is called, usually called the discriminant. It's of co-dimension 1 inside of CK. So it's sitting inside of CK. It's the image of the singular set. And usually called the discriminant, but in older terminology, it was called the apparent contour. You think of looking at this and kind of looking at it on the wall, um, being projected onto the wall. And this is the picture you see projected onto the wall, hence the terminology apparent contour. Okay. And Zariski equisingularity was simply a step by step procedure. You define VK0. You now do this for a family. So we put a subscript T so that everything is now a family with a varying T. And Zariski equisingularity would says that this is Zariski equisingularity if the next step down. This is now dimension k minus 1 if that's Zariski equisingularity. And as you work your way down the final answer, whether it was or not equisingularity, equisingular is when you get to dimension 0 where you're just counting multiplicity of points. But it's easier to stop at dimension 1 when you get to dimension 1. You've got down to the point of, so k is 2. Your discriminant is dimension 1 inside of 2. So you've got delta 0 sitting inside of c2 0. Again, this is a family. But this is a plane curve inside of C2. And in this dimension, already back in the late 60s, 
it was well known that every different version of equisingularity was equivalent. You could talk about the topology of this. The topology here is, well, let me draw a picture of the topology, but let me just say that topology is the same thing as equisingularity of every type. So there's um, Whitney was the first person to really play around with equisingularity ideas. So Whitney equisingularity is an early version, and then Zariski equisingularity is the strongest, and all of these are equivalent. So let me simply give you a picture of the topology. And I'll give a picture of the topology by simply giving an example of a curve. And a, a plane curve, a curve inside of C2. So I'll, I'll start off with, well, I'd like to give a slightly non-trivial example. So the example I'm going to give is the set of xy with y written as x to the 3 over 2 plus x to the 5 over 3. And you can solve this and turn it into a polynomial equation, but I want to write it this way. If you don't like to have exponents, you can also write it parametrically as t to the 6, comma, t to the 9, comma, t to plus t to the 10. That's what this is parametrically. in terms of a par parameter t. Okay. So let's actually draw a picture of this. Okay. So since y is a power of x bigger than 1, that means that it's very, very much smaller than x. So if I draw my x plane like this, and I don't have room to draw a y plane, so let me just draw a single line as the y plane. Everything happens very close in to this x plane. And in fact, if you forget the x to the 5 over 3 and just look at the link of what you get there, you have a curve that goes, that actually ends up closing up after going twice around the circle. So I'm drawing the link of the curve, it goes twice around, crossing a total of, I hope I've got this right, three times to get a trefoil knot. So you've got a trefoil knot as you go around in the link of y equals x to the 3 over 2. But now then the x to the 5 over 3 takes this trefoil knot and does a cabling on it. So we had our original trefoil knot. And now it gets cabled. I won't try to draw the cabling. But in fact, you have three strands now running around and getting cabled around your original tre trefoil knot. And so this is a picture of this particular plane curve drawing its link and everything shrinking down rapidly towards the origin. Now one way of classifying this is we can look in the y direction. Remember the y direction I've drawn one dimensional, but it's actually two dimensional. So let me draw it as a disk. And I'll look at where this disk going through a point intersects the curve, and it intersects It's going to intersect at a total of six points. Let me draw those six points. You have the original x to the 3 over 2 goes, to, goes in two points reasonably far apart. Their distance apart is proportional to distance from the origin raised to the 3 over 2. But then these points are replaced by three points because of the cabling. And these are distance um, 5 over 3 apart. 
so they're much closer together. So when we intersect with a plane like this, we have a total of six points, p1 up to p6, with the distance between pi, pj. Well, pi, pj is of order epsilon to the 3 over 2. If i and j are both in the range 1 through 3, or both in the range 4 through 6. Sorry, that, that's where I get 5 over 3. If they're all in one of the groups or in one of the other groups, and it's big O of epsilon to the 3 over 2, if pi and pj are in separate groups, so i as in 1 to 3, and j as in 4 to 6. Okay. So we have a collection of six points with these rational numbers giving rate of shrink towards the origin. And so we're getting a nice structure there. And it turns out that this is one of the ways of classifying the topology. If you take a section by a plane, just look at the points and their rates of shrinking together. That gives a complete description of the topology of the singularities. So that's one way of seeing the topology. So let me enhance this picture a little bit. Remember, I'm taking a section here at a single point on the y-plane at a certain distance away from the y-plane. And in the y-plane, I can go around. And as I go around, as I move around in the y-plane, so varying y with distance epsilon from the origin, as I move around, these groups of three points are twisting around as you go around. These groups of two point, two groups are twisting at a slightly slower rate as you go around. And this is Leidong Trang called this the carousel for obvious reasons. What you have is a picture of seats on a disk rotating as you move around the y-axis. So. Let's see, I'm running out of time. I'm supposed to stop at 10 of or later? Pardon? Three is OK. OK, good. Then let me. So the carousel is very powerful, in fact. The carousel, as a way of classifying plane curves, it's really giving you a nice picture, a picture of how these plane curves intersect disks as you run around. And it's giving a complete description of the topology of the plane curve. So now I'd like to go back to Zariski equisingularity and talk about, I'm going to look at my V0 contained in some Cn0. And I said that the risky equisingularity depends on projecting. You project this V to C20. And inside of here, you look at the discriminant, which is a curve inside of C2. OK. And this is classifying structure, if you want, for Zariski equisingularity. So here we have simply a plane curve. And let me give you a nice example of this. Let me draw an explicit example. It's an example that we recently came across in order to verify that the gap that we thought we might have in our in our proof actually was a gap that there were examples that we'd overlooked. So the example I'm going to look at is I first of all start with 
this equation, x squared c plus y cubed, x to the fifth plus y squared c cubed. And I can think of this. This is homogeneous as I've drawn it. So I can think of it inside of CP2. And so it gives me a nice curve inside of CP2. But then I add the whole degree here is degree 8. So I'm going to add a z to the ninth term equal to 0. And this sort of singularity where you start off with something homogeneous, which is basically describing what the tangent cone of your singularity is, and then adding one term of one higher degree are called super isolated singularities. And they're due to Luengo back in the, I think it was the mid 1980s or so. And they've turned out to be a marvelous set of examples for proving and disproving things. And Johnny Wall and I had a conjecture in the mid 80s, which um, I forgot the, who it was killed it by using super isolated singularities. There were various other conjectures about the invariance of singularities, which were disproved using this like, sort of singularity. And this example is an example of a of something that behaved in a manner that we had overlooked when proving our original theorem. So let me actually draw draw the carousel picture for it. So let me the discriminant in this case is rather dramatic. It has thirty two components. So it's a plain curve with 32 connected components. But in fact, the bulk of it is, consists of three interesting curves. There's a plain curve in the middle, which simply has four, four points rotating, rotating around. And remember, each piece here is associated with a rate. A uh, rate here was, what was it, 5 over 3. And the rate between them, the rate between them was 3 over 2. So here we have a rate which is actually, what was that rate? For, this is a 5 over 4 rate. So here we've got a curve shrinking at rate 5 over 4. In between it, we have. In a carousel, we have a piece. And it looks like five pieces. But remember, as you rotate around, things are rotating. So the, this point and this point actually belong to something that's connected. So here we have something of rate 7 over 5. And outside it, let me try and draw this, we have a total of seven points going through, and their rate is 10 over 7. Uh, sorry, these inside things are 10 over 7. The outside piece is 8 over 7. So we have a carousel where there's a piece which is actually, you have pieces which are actually, ah, this is a 6 over 5, sorry. This is 6 over 5, and here we have 7 over 5. So near to where you have branch points, things are even thinner. So you have a, here a carousel where you're picking out neighborhoods of branch points, which are even thinner. And we've got here three of the 32 components. The other 29 components consist of 11 components which look like this, of type 3 over 2, 11 of these. And I think it was 15 components, which are simply the polar goes through a point, but it's going through. It can actually moves around if you change your direction of slope. So this is, this is the sort of picture one gets. And And 
And it was a, and it's fairly difficult to prove that the outer geometry is sufficient, just knowing V with its outer geometry, is sufficient to actually recover all this structure from V. So recovering the discriminant curve and di recovering how it lies there. And let me just point out, what actually now sees the decomposition into ciphered fibered pieces, this whole thing here is something of degree 8. So what this means is that when, you, when we took our original V and projected it to the plane, it's actually an eightfold covering branched these singular points. So we've got a degree 8 covering over here. And when we want to see the actual ciphered fibered pieces, we have to lift them back up into V and see what they are in V. And the ciphered structure down below is easy to see. You've got these nice pieces where as they rotate around, everything's rotating smoothly, and it's easy to see the ciphered structure. When you lift it up, you're taking covering covers of it. And let me just draw you what the fibers are. Remember, the pieces now are uh, the pieces in the link are um, bundles over the circle with fibers and the pieces as they turn out to be if I can find my picture which I've lost I'll let me do it from memory what we have is that the 7 over 5 piece when you lift it up it becomes a surface of genus 2 with three boundaries. This piece over here becomes a surface of genus 3 when you lift it up with three boundaries. These get glued together along two annuli which are coming from the 5 over 4 piece. This is actually only one piece because as you rotate around in the y direction these two exchange. So your fiber is this. And then it continues on at this side. I've forgotten. Oh, you have the 15. No, sorry, you have five, five holes at this end coming from a different part of the geometric structure. Let's see. Here. And three, three at the other end. So this is the fiber of the structure when you look at it as a bundle of the circle. And then you have the thick part, the, which is conical, which glues onto this in a way that I don't have time to describe. But here you have this along with, because it gets rotated around and glued together with some quasi-finite mapping, you get a nice ciphered fiber pieces glued together, giving you the structure. So I'll stop there. Thank you.